Thank you. So our final poet and reader tonight is Bill Yarrow, the author of Blasphemer, which he'll be reading from for us, as well as Pointed Sentences and Four Chapbooks. His poems have appeared in many print and online magazines, including Poetry International, Rhino, Frigg, Altered Scale, Contrary, Thush, Thrush Poetry, and others. He is a professor of English at Joliet Junior College, where he teaches creative writing, Shakespeare, and film. Welcome, Bill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you, Ralph, for setting this up. Thank you, Bookseller, uh, for uh, hosting us. Thank you, uh, Stella, for reading. It's a pleasure to see you again. I've read with Stella before and saw her in a wonderful panel at AWP, The Daughters of Baba Yaga, who was uh, outstanding. Oh, what? In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, yeah. And uh, I had the pleasure of uh, being on a panel with Ralph at uh, Hunter College in New York, uh, and that's when we first met. Uh, so wonderful. Thank you, Ralph, for, uh, for uh, uh, contacting me about this. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from Bless Deemer and a, a few poems uh, uh, that are newer. Um, this poem is called, There's No Crying in Poetry. <laughs> <laughs> There's No Crying in Poetry. There's no crying in poetry, says Coach Bukowski, barnacle gnarled, stomping on the ground behind third base. But the poetry pitcher is crying. The poetry catcher is sobbing. The poetry shortstop is bawling. The poetry center fielder is doubled over, weeping bitterly. Bukowski shakes his head. Jesus, how the hell did I wind up here? He yells, hey, there's no crying in fucking poetry. You hear me? But no one on the poetry team is listening. <laughs> but in a beer garden across the street, the bar poets, looking up, are waving gloves at the ball, sailing toward them. They stretch their hands above their heads and call out, I got it. No, I got it. I said, I got it. And then they collide and lie like kinks in a tangled hose. The ball lands and takes a bad hop, hits the barmaid, smack on the lip. Don't you cry. Don't you dare, she hears Bukowski saying, and though it really hurts. And though she really wants to, she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Stella mentioned blurbs, uh, that uh, Ralph blurbed uh, her book. And uh, as you put out a book, you're asked to collect blurbs from different people. And blurbs are generally very, very complimentary, very flattering, very effusive. Uh, but I've noticed that in recent years, the blurbs have gotten a little edgier, a little less kind, a little less polite. And so this poem is called The New Blurb. And it has an epigraph, which is, the old blurb is predictable in its praise and universally ignored. <laughs> so this is the new blurb, number one. This book touches your heart, but not in a good way. <laughs> Two. Every day, I thank God that books like this are hard to find. <laughs> Three, to give you a sense of how infectious this book is, after I read it, I felt ill. <laughs> Number four, there's nothing to be said about this book that hasn't already been said about some other book. <laughs> Number five, this is just the kind of book I never read and you should too. <laughs> Number six, this book does the work of imagination for you in that it's hard to imagine how it could be any worse. <laughs> Number seven, if I truly understood all that's in this book, I would go mad and I don't have the insurance coverage for that. <laughs> Number eight, I found this book being not hard to write, very easy to ignore. <laughs> Number nine, don't let the fact that the writing in this book is terrible dissuade you from buying it. Support independent presses. <laughs> Number 10. This book proves the truth of the falsehood. Anyone can be a writer. <laughs> so uh, some people, some poets write from prompts. Uh, and I thought I would put together a poem of prompts that maybe have helped to other poets or those of you in the audience who like to write. So this is called Prompts. Write a poem beginning with the word bed in which the word horse or alpine appears in the seventh line. 
write a poem in which fraternal twins marry accountants. <laughs> <laughs> write a poem in which the last letter of the third word in every line spells out your home state. Write a poem in which your father is a dog and you are his leash. <laughs> Write a poem constructed from four syllable words in your favorite recipes. <laughs> Write a poem of a thousand lines in which prime numbers figure prominently. <laughs> Write a poem whose first word is also its last word, whose second word is also its eleventh word, whose 45th word is also its 60th, 17th, and 39th word, and whose 100th word is a foreign word. <laughs> Write a poem in which Christian missionaries become dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> Write a poem whose refrain is any three consecutive lines from Lycidas. Write a poem in which Cinderella is in prison for tax fraud. Write a poem whose total syllables number 613. Write a poem in which the narrator is the weather. <laughs> write a poem in which the spirit of your dead cat tells you what to write your next poem about. <laughs> write a poem that does not contain the color red. <laughs> this is called Proverbs of the Converted. That's since I'm doing these funny poems, though. Another um, Proverbs of the Converted. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single ticket. A person is known by the company he shuns. A good man is hard to solicit. Where there's a will, there is death. A house divided against itself cannot multiply. <laughs> if you lie down with writers, you'll get up with bullshit. <laughs> this is called uh, Nonce Upon a Time. She had a smile like an ornate beer stain. She weaved in and out of her intelligence like a chipmunk in syrup. Pleasure, she lisped, is too momentary to make me happy. She never tired of saying that or un unbuttoning her blouse whenever she felt old. How can you not be attracted to me, she asked. Easy, I thought. I find you vile. But I pretended I hadn't heard what she said and just smiled. Then she stood up and languidly stretched and I felt a sunbeam fall across my soul. My heart turned to warm water. I melted like desire, like the twin towers on the day after they were gone. I was optimism hardened by confidence. I quoted Kierkegaard, pleasure disappoints, possibility never. <laughs> what kind of crack is that, she snarled. The muse is a harsh mistress. <laughs> poem's title uh, comes from a line in a play by Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, No Exit, and if you remember the last line of that play, the title will make sense to you. This is called Poetry is Other People. <laughs> is there nothing out there but misery, tales of human fading, nomenclatures of a fallen body, even if we forbade the saddest subjects, the tornadoes would still be there. The typhoon, the mudslide, the angry snow squall, the red volcano, the bridge collapsing, the window crashing onto the sidewalk, the flames leaping from roof to roof, from car to car, from tree to tree, insolent and snickering would still be there. The poems that are not destruction, what are they but decay? Did you read the one about the depression? of the poet's brother, the one about the bulimia of the poet's daughter, the one about the alcoholism of the poet's mother, the one about the leukemia of the poet's father, the one about the dementia of the poet's grandmother, the one about the divorce of the poet's sister, the one about the autism of the poet's nephew, the one about the drowning of the poet's uncle, the one about the diabetes of the poet's aunt, the one about the disappearance of the poet's neighbor, 
the one about the incarceration of the poet's friend, the one about the suicide of the poet. We live where it's light, but right where it's dark. Thrill at the thundercloud, shun the sunshine. Pine for midnight, worship the ontology of catastrophe. The poet says, somebody's done for. The poet says, you must change your life. The poet says, I must lie down where all the ladders start. The poet says, I weep like a child for the past. The poet says, my mind's not right. The poet says, if I stepped out of my body, I would break. So um, this is a poem called Dead Parental Units. Um, it's two 13-line sonnets written 30 years apart. Uh, but when I finally put them together, I got it published, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> One, each death a sonnet, every grief 14 lines not yours. I refuse you this thing. I sat next to you in the hospital, your mouth open on one side, your last breath escaped. I connect you with no other dead or myself with weeping sons. I am only this son holding his father's dead hand, watching his father's dead mouth. I will not write you sonnets. Sonnets are boxes, spaces for pain, graves to lie in. Grades, I withhold your raw last line. Two, another, my father's death, now my mother's death. Another death, another sonnet, every grief, 14 fucking lines. Not yours, I stood next to you in my sister's house. The family huddled around like reporters in a tornado. Terrified, we watched you drown. At dawn, they wheeled you out. Yes, mothers die and sons are very sad, but I am not one of the many. I am one of the few who will not write you sonnets. I'm sorry, maybe that would have given you, what? Solace, satisfaction? Sonnets are boxes, coffins. You want me to build you a coffin? How many coffins do you need? I got to uh, travel to Jordan uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was an amazingly beautiful country. It was so interesting, so diverse, and all uh, its different uh, geography. Um, and uh, we got to go to a city uh, called Ajloun, and there's an old castle there, and so this is called Ajloun Castle. You, my little cat, are brisk and fluid. I, like an owl, am stiff and staid. You clambered up the rocks and held out your arms. The wind, in a swoosh, came up behind you. Incredulous, I watched you fall. You did not see me looking as you stood, placid, impassive, looking out over the cardamom hills. But then, the wind mistook your arms for wings. And helpless, I watched you fall. Horrified, I watched you fall through the future and into the past. Past your family, past your accolades, past your handsome penchant for reconciliation into the universal solvent of your confidence. I saw you dashed upon low stones. I saw you bounce into the sea. I saw you sink into inky velvet. My tragedy is that my imagination pictures all the facets of disaster. But you see only soaring, and that is your invincible gift. Um, this poem uh, will appear in a, a journal called E-Ratio, um, and it's called Two Weeks in a Dristan Land. When I washed up alone on the shore of the blistered isle, I smelled the bleach of burst anemones, the sweet arousal of the Dungeness crabs, the seaweed of sour twigs and feces. I saw debutante goddesses abashing their swains for what hadn't come to pass. 
I felt the uncanny glee of the solitary palm, the dilatory curiosity of the air, the aloofness of the chimerical trees. I heard dolphins and swans aligned against integrity conspire to co-opt the sunshine and humble the thunder. I tasted hostility in the meanest weed, a cynical longevity in the beach fleas and swamp bees, a flash of happiness in the bold symmetry of the island flag, and resolved in my lately vacant heart to replace Othello's handkerchief, to repent spurning Cleopatra the queen, and to restore the itching eyes of Gloucester. Um, this is called uh, The Rising Tide. Um, there's a new journal in Chicago called Caravel, uh, edited by Eric Allen Yankee. And uh, first issue just came out, so this poem's in that mm -hmm. issue. And I encourage you to check it out online, and uh, if you're a writer yourself, to send Eric some of your, uh, your work. Um, the Rising Tide. The new world is filled with old people, with good posture and a disdain for odd postures. I'm just a rental dog myself, looking for the guardian of starlight, peeing on the expired parking meters, and barking up all the wrong trees. A decade ago, I was new myself. They put me in a factory next to Six Fingered Marie and gave me tea biscuits and sugar water at four hour intervals. My hands crumpled from the ironwork, and only a jug handle yoga pose could unbend me. And so it will be with my soulless effigy, as proleptic ratiocination seeps into itself and disappears, as the polished ego dips directly into dullness, as Ivan Karamazov deliquesces, as Imlac loses his footing, as Lear begins to stink, as Pangloss rises again. This poem is called uh, Cranshaw on a Boat. It appeared on Rhino a couple issues ago. <laughs> um, we're floating on the chain of lakes eating Rice Krispies out of a bucket. The sun is a soft lozenge medicating a bright red sky. Water skiers hold onto their slackening ropes like love itself. On party island, the icy drunks have seized control. Cranshaw has his hand inside Margaret. No one is shocked. He was born brazen. But when he starts in on the Jews, Arnie gets mad and pushes him over the side. We let him tread water, then swing around to pick him up. Remorse? No. Margaret wants him back. the best banana bread. Cousin Ed was a spoiled banana no one wanted to touch. Inexcusably bruised, the kid turned rotten, descending into dice and mash and reds and chew. I couldn't understand anything he said, like, my car has acne. He means rust, my father explained. Like, I want surgery for dinner. He means takeout, said my mom. I flexed my ego. I dismissed him as unlettered, a no account, a rube. My arrogance was raging and rancid. The condescension of a 13-year-old punk has no peer. Thank God we don't stay 13 forever. I thought my cousin, drug addict, alcoholic, tobacco addict, gambling addict, a total failure. I have different addictions. Who am I to judge this? I thought my cousin unsophisticated, no acquaintance with literature or art, ignorant of any kind of culture or class. Turns out he thought in metaphor, which Aristotle calls genius. I thought a banana that had turned black from age was garbage. Turns out that black bananas and sour milk make the best banana bread.
Um, this is a poem that, uh, uh, whose title comes from uh, the book of Job, and a number of the lines in the uh, poem come from the book of Job. It's called Blackish by Reason of the Ice. I was in the basement. I was in the basement with Sarah, who was reading Job to the baby. I was standing in the basement thinking about Uncle Conrad's terrible black tie, 100% polyester, which he wore to the funeral last Tuesday. I was in the basement with Sarah, whose eyes were eyes of flesh, whose eyes were like the eyelids of mourning, who had made a covenant with mine eyes. And I said to her, Sarah, do you taketh it with your eyes? And she said, what? And I said, do you taketh it with your eyes? And she said, stop being stupid. Can you hold the baby? <laughs> and I said, I had not been as infants which never saw light. And she said, sharpening her eyes upon me, take the fucking baby. And I took the baby. And I rocked the baby. And the baby rocked me. And as I comforted my son, and as my son comforted me, I remembered they called Edward Dahlberg the Job of American letters because he suffered in his art. Many there are who work hard and suffer neglect. All Job's? Sarah, I called. Do you taketh it with your eyes? But she was lost, lost in the text, and heard me not. And then, for just a moment, I too felt lost, like a child, like someone who meets with darkness in the daytime and gropes in the midday as in the night. Of course, I knew we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness alone any more than Uncle Conrad could have worn a different tie to the wake. For life is wind, and death is astonishment. Sarah, I implored, take the baby, for he hath made me weary. And Sarah took the baby with her eyes. And I'm going to finish with this one. This is called Fatuous Dialogue Number 12. Was it true what you wrote in that poem? Pretty true. What do you mean pretty true? Was it true or wasn't it? It was as close as you get to truth in poems. I don't understand. <laughs> poems say things like, it was sunny when I knocked out Barbie Arnstein's teeth. Maybe it was sunny. Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Maybe it was Jimmy Irving, not Bobby Arnstein, whose teeth I knocked out. Maybe I didn't knock out Jimmy's teeth at all. Maybe I just pushed him. Maybe he hit his head on the railing. Maybe he didn't. Maybe his mother came running out screaming at me. Maybe she didn't. <laughs> Maybe I did smell her perfume mixed with the stink of ginkgo berries as she stood over her unconscious boy. Maybe I did. So, poems are lies. Pretty much. <laughs> Thank you very much.